Dear Computers and Writing Colleagues, Can we, in the words of Alan Iverson and more recently Casey Boyle, talk about practice? I'm especially interested in the idea of using computers to guide practice, to help learners see and understand what their practice looks like and how to improve it. In my own life, as I'll show you, I often use technologies like my mobile phone, my laptop, various kinds of smart devices that can communicate with my computer or my phone, and web services of various kinds to understand my practice sessions. These are the kinds of questions I often have on the screen here. Am I doing enough of the right things to get better? I have these same questions, by the way, as a teacher. When I think about my students, I'm, am I giving them enough of the right kind of practice in order for them to improve? Chris Gallagher has been asking the rhetoric and composition community to turn its attention once again to writers' behavior, to focus more on, as he puts it, what writers do. Today, I'm asking the computers and writing community to do that too. As a community, I don't know that we have been as concerned with using computers to guide practice as we should have been. We're more often interested in using computers as a medium for practice, like in multimodal composing. And this is great. I just think we can do more. We could use computers to get students to understand their writing practice better and how to improve it. Today, we now have our, our, at our disposal some remarkable technology for seeing practice. We can use technology to attend to the frequency, intensity, and quality of our practice. And doing that can help us and our students get better. A lot of this technology is pretty new. And to show you what I mean, I want to take you on a quick tour to the not-so-distant past, to 2011, as a matter of fact. These are clips from three different demonstration projects completed in 2011 by the Wide Research Center here at Michigan State, which I co-directed at the time. The 2011 Michigander Bike Ride, the 2011 Bridge Run, and the 2011 Ride to Computers and Writing Fundraiser. These projects marked a turning point for my colleagues and me, the team that also brings you, by the way, Eli Review, and a few others, the Hedgematic, several other writing technologies too. But it was another app called RideStream that helped us focus on this problem I'm talking about today, harnessing the streams of activity that digital services make available in order to see practice. Our goal then and now was to help folks use that data in interesting ways. And like all mad scientists, we experimented on ourselves. We went to hell and back several times. What this work taught us is that we could fashion useful feedback from activity streams, feedback that helps folks trying to improve in some way, to learn, and to better achieve their goals. We saw, too, that the best way to do this was to help individuals understand how they were part of a larger social scene, how they compared with others, Yes, but also how they could collaborate and share with other people, working together to meet bigger shared objectives. Our experiments with activity streaming coincided with others that were doing similar work. Here's a timeline with a few key moments that are interesting. It's hard to imagine now, but in 2018, a world without Facebook's individualized activity timeline, isn't it? But when we were building the RideStream app in 2010, Facebook was still only showing a news feed to all of the people. Come to think of it, I'm not sure if that one has worked out quite the way we all would have hoped. We learned a lot from our work on activity streams. Activity streams can support ad hoc coordination, calibration, and course correction on the fly. Activity streams can be turned into feedback. 
And that feedback affords a balance between managing a group's progress towards a specific shared outcome and allowing individuals to improvise in the face of emergent challenges. The picture here was taken by Ride to CNW coordinator extraordinaire Suzanne Bloom Malley in 2011. It shows a dead end that was not represented on a map that some of us were using to do route planning for our ride to Ann Arbor. When the photo appeared in the ride stream, Others behind this group that Suzanne was in, including myself, were able to reroute to arrive at a shared destination. And so we learned from others' experience. For me, using technology to improve practice has been, well, let's say I've probably gone where few have gone before. In 2016, I participated in a NASA study connected to the Mars mission. I did a structured workout every day for six months, and I was tested consistently and rigorously throughout that time, every single day, in fact. I had access to state-of-the-art technology for measuring my fitness and for improving my practice in all sorts of ways. I learned a lot about what I can do to structure that practice. Since then, I've been putting those lessons to use in all kinds of other areas, the most recent is in music, but the basic ideas are the same. We live in amazing times. In many different areas of our lives, we can use these technologies to track our activity, to see our practice, to make changes, and to improve. There are four key things that I mentioned before that we can become attuned to in particular, and these work across many different areas of practice. Repetition, frequency, intensity, and quality. My colleagues on the panel and I are all talking about how we use our bikes to write, let's call them practice logs, records of our performance that can be used in various ways. Here are some of the examples of the way I use my bike, a smart trainer equipped with a Bluetooth transmitter, a power meter, my computer, two and two web services, one called Zwift, which is a virtual world for riding and running, and one called Strava, which is a site that lets me record, upload, analyze, and share workout details. With these, I can see repetition and frequency, see that in the lower left, I can see intensity, upper right, and I can even have a sense of the quality of my practice. All of these let me know if my workouts consist of enough of the right kind of practice in order to expect improvement. You might wonder how well they work. Well, last year, Strava arrived at the same number, estimating my baseline fitness by tracking my workouts as a group of NASA scientists did. 253 was my FTP. The reason Strava can do that is that they have millions of riders to compare me to. It makes up for the lack of precision in any individual measurement remarkably well. And here's the key point for me. For guiding my own practice, the combination I use with Strava is accurate, fast, inexpensive, and effective. You don't have to train like an astronaut to get NASA quality data in 2018. All of this work today is also informing how we have engineered Eli Review, our web service that helps teachers structure peer learning practice for writers. So today we can do things similar to what I've just shown you with cycling and bass playing, but with writing. I'm gonna walk you through a few examples, and the goal is to get you intrigued to learn more about how we can attend to what writers do. Today, I'm not going to go into all the work we've done to date to try and establish and validate our measures, particularly for intensity and quality of practice in writing, which are not nearly as transparent as repetition and frequency of practice in writing. My colleague Melissa Graham Meeks and I have talked about these elsewhere and are publishing this work. So if you're interested, I have more to say, please let me know. For now, though, let me say that the graphs you're about to see show repetition, frequency, and intensity in one view. The intensity measure is not just one indicator. It's a combination of several, in fact, seven, weighted factors. 
These are what you see in the table here. The measures we take are normed, so the performances of an individual that we measure are highlighted um, when we highlight them have some context in broad terms. The population of writers they're part of and their immediate peer learning group or their classmates in most cases. At this point we've done projections like the ones I'm going to show you in about 60 different classes of various sizes. Hundreds of students at various types of institutions ranging from K-12 to law school and in different disciplines. We're growing more and more confident that what we see is reliable and accurate. With the views I'm about to show you, we can see a few interesting things, but the most interesting is whether a student has practiced enough for us to expect improvement. Here's an individual student report. All the data here is cleared for use by an IRB and has been appropriately de-identified. On the x-axis, we can see 13 tasks spread across a 14-week semester. The bars show our measure of intensity. Blue is, a weight, is weighted slightly more than orange in this view, I'll just let you know, but both matter and are part of a single exercise. The red line near the bottom of the graph shows the harmonic mean of, of the group among the bottom 30% of classmates. The green line shows the top 30%. In this group, we can see a very clear and consistent difference in every exercise between the top and the bottom 30. This helps us understand where any individual might fall. Note that with this chart, we can also see performance and change over time. The student shown here started fairly strong and grew stronger due to consistent, frequent practice that grew in intensity. So what that means, quite simply, is we can expect this student to improve. What do we think about this student? Like our strong performer, we see very consistent practice week to week. This student is in the top 30% in four of our indicators, as you see in the chart, in the table rather, and in the middle group for three other factors. This is a pattern we'd expect from a student who started well, perhaps cautiously, and then picked up the pace at the end. We can expect improvement here as well. How about now? Will this student get better? I'll tell you, this is a struggling student. Each week they showed up for practice, that's a good thing, but they did almost the minimum. They hovered near the bottom 30% line the whole term if you look at the blue bars. The student did not miss any practice sessions, but did not work consistently at a level to be confident that they could approve. Now here's a feel-good story. And it teaches us something about how our criteria of frequency, repetition, and intensity work together. The student, you'll notice, wobbles a bit at the start, then sees the value of the work and ramps up their contributions over time. But notice that with each new challenge, each new assignment, we see the same pattern repeat. Progress is not, in other words, a smooth upward curve. It is recursive. This student has to have some confidence that the process works. Happily, it appears that is the case. The wobbly period gets shorter over time, and the student is learning new habits. We may need to be patient in order to see them translate to improvement in writing performance for this student. By now, you can probably tell me what's happening here, right? Here's a consistent pattern of behavior that indicates that a student is not improving. This student simply did too little to learn. The gray bars that go below the baseline represent our effort to calculate practice missed. We borrow a technique from clinical trials here called intent to treat analysis 
And the idea is to account for positive or negative effects in a group when an intervention is missed for some reason. This graph shows that even when the student was present for practice, they missed out on the benefit because the effort was just not there. All the information I've shown you is available today inside Eli Review. You can get it all and make these same charts for your students if you're interested. And if you are interested, get in touch. But that's really not why I'm giving this demonstration to you today. What I want to leave you with is let's do more of this kind of thing. Let's pay attention to how our learners practice and let's use the technology we have now access to to help them practice more, more frequently with appropriate intensity and quality so that they too can improve. Thank you.